Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is evening in Geneva, morning in the United States, where my great co-speaker now is. Today we continue our series of credit legends, and today we have a person with whose career I'm really inspired with. This is John LaRocca. Uh, person whose titles and achievements in credit management is the list of whose achievements and titles in credit management is so long so if I start it now I believe I will finish exactly by the time of today's event uh, I mentioned I mentioned him in all the announcements and I gave I tagged him so you can go simply to LinkedIn and see who is John LaRocca and uh, today we will be discovering in details his career steps and to continue bridging generations of credit management so please welcome me uh, join me welcoming John LaRocca John please Andre thank you for the invitation and my mother would have loved you for being so nice to her son <laughs> well thank you very much i uh, I, I you know I, I that's what i try to say people usually too good to me <laughs> yeah. uh, and i'm and i'm very happy to be here and i'm humble to be here because i've i've had some experience and you want to spend the next hour or so talking about my experience and usually I'm interviewing other people or telling them what I think, not telling them about me. So this is an unusual situation for me, and I hope I come across in an effective and humble way. Well, uh, you you are, I mean, if the if I would choose, uh, you know, if I would choose one of your skills which I would like to have for myself is, you know, your ability to be humble. Thanks. That's really appreciate because I got so much to learn in this respect as as, as any public person. Okay, John, uh, let's start with our questions, and uh, you already you already gave me some answers, and you, there are like I promise you one tricky question today. I found that there will be two, so be prepared. But I don't I, I don't believe they will be. Mm, difficult for you to, so don't be scared uh, <laughs> okay. I didn't invite you here as a legend to you know to to to, to bring you kind of torture everything <laughs> no, so it's it's not about me uh, and thanks God I like I like the series of legends because I don't have too much to say I'm just asking questions Look, uh, our first question to is traditional to our legends is what was your really the first job, the first, the first really, really paid job, not necessarily credit management. So how did you start to work? When I was uh, 13 and 14 years old, I had a paper route in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where I grew up. And it was for a newspaper that doesn't exist anymore called the Evening and Sunday Bulletin. I delivered 53 or 54 daily papers six days a week and 54 papers on Sunday. But on, on Wednesday and Thursday evenings, I had to go back to my customers and collect money. Every Wednesday night and Thursday night, I went ringing doorbells and knocking on doorknobs to ask people to pay me for the newspaper. And sometimes I had to wait until Friday night and go out again because on Saturday morning, I had to pay for my newspapers from the prior week. So I got involved in collections as a boy at 13 years old. I didn't realize that's what I was doing. I was just making money delivering newspapers. But when I saw your question, and I've had the question for a month or so, I thought that's my first job and it's also my first job in collections well so if I understood correctly you were granting credit 
and you were collecting cash so you you will you, you were like credit manager and delivery manager and somehow sales manager as well in one phase yes and and we called that job paper boy <laughs> that was my ah. title <laughs> yes. yeah so i mean that, that but that was so. my responsibility to do those things and and often and we and we also collected money for magazines that were okay. delivered and and those bills could be a, a lot of money to a paper boy at 13 years old because you had to pay for that because you were assumed you were collecting it and people always did not answer their door and sometimes you would get them every four or five weeks and then they would say oh i can't owe you for four or five weeks it can't be that long. It can't be $12. It must be $3. And, and I have to pay $11 to make $1, if you understand. So I learned negotiations, ineffective negotiations, at an early age. So luckily, I mean, we, we, don't, we don't judge. But your first job, your very, very first job was concerned with credit management. So you started to be a credit whoever Cre yes. credit, I, I call it i used to call it credit manager so you entered credit manager credit management being 13 years old yes i was the amazing. order to cash manager for my newspaper route yes yeah amazing amazing you know well, well, I, I was very impressed with my grandma who started to work as accountant uh, after account, okay, bookkeeper, not not like accountant in uh, in a Western uh, in a Western understanding, but she started to work in accountant, being sixteen years old, just after World War Two. But you started being thirteen years old, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Imagine how how many years John has. So imagine how how much time he spent. In, in credit management, assuming, assuming, assuming he started th being, th he started 13, he been 13 years old, so it's above, it's, it's, it's pretty much above 60 years. It is exactly 60 years. <laughs> I didn't want to, to, to mention you. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, to, 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 mention, to mention your age. And so our second question becomes irrelevant because your first job was your credit job. And you, you get there just because you needed money. You didn't choose credit as a career. No. No. So it chose me. <laughs> so credit chosen you. <laughs> because that was, that, that was you know uh, like you know if if there is nothing to to fill the time of conference with people start to say started to ask question how did you get to credit and you know whether or not you've chosen credit management as a profession i spoke with thousands of people and everybody say look no, we didn't choose credit that, that that was not a profession we were dreaming during the night in the school like no, you, 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 you did you, you, you wasn't that that kind of person as well. No, and the and in those days, I believe the university in Leeds in the UK has yeah. a credit management or had a credit management major, but other than that university, I knew of no other school that offered a major where you could pick credit as your field of study. You mean major uh, as a master's degree? Yes. Well, yes. That's, uh, I think, I think also open, open university in UK that they, they, they provide a master of business administration with credit and obviously leads university, but we will, we will speak about this. It's, yes. it's, quite interesting but you did a great extremely long way in credit management so from that guy who was collecting money for papers up to head of credit 
and not only one company as a head of credit and uh, all actually at least two Hewlett Packard and Hitachi the only two I know you know in my quick position you were head of credit management for both companies so uh, you managed to go through the whole this way and obviously you did that successfully otherwise there was no reason for promotion it's quite some but uh, if I just ask you uh, what are what were your three or one or whatever many um, whatever number of key success factors in credit management which made your which which really helped you or maybe principles what is your credit management or credit manager success recipe so uh, i i never planned to be a credit manager even though i had that early experience as a newspaper uh -huh. boy uh, when i finished my high school in the united states at 18 years old uh -huh. uh, i was a itinerant musician and i hoped to be a music teacher that was my aspiration and the reason i wanted to be a music teacher is because i was in a school band and we had some more than modest success but as an individual performer i had no success except uh -huh. My mother liked the way I played the saxophone, but Are other you than that, saxophone. Yes. Okay. And it was early. It was 1967, and the Vietnam War was everything that was going on in the United States. And in my senior year in high school, a boy that graduated two years before me was in the Marine Corps, a very little boy, and he was a clarinet player. Mm -hmm. And he went to Vietnam, and a week later he came back in a coffin. And at that point, I decided I didn't want to go to college. I was going to go into the military, and I was going to avenge his death. I was 17, and I was full of vim and vigor, and not much sense. Mm -hmm. But that's how I felt. And, and I had aspired, I mentioned, to be a school music teacher. And I had taken the examination to go to Temple University's School of Music in Philadelphia. And I, two years before, I started to play the clarinet. I would take lessons to do that. I took lessons to do dictation. I don't know if you're familiar, but the ability to stand on the other side of the piano and have to have to write down what the notes were being played on the piano yes and i and i was tone deaf so i was at a great disadvantage and my teacher said to me you will make a wonderful teacher john and i said mr russo why do you think i'd make a wonderful teacher and he said because it comes so difficult for you i wasn't a very good musician but it's what i wanted to do so i graduate high school and I need to get a, I, I, enri I enlist in the military, mm -hmm. but because of my left eye, which had a, a stigmatism, I went to four branches of service and they all rejected me because they said, if you lose your glasses, you won't be able to find your way around in Vietnam very well. So I was deferred. And I took my first job looking for people who would i was coming back to my senses now i needed a college education but i had did no preparation so i went to get the first job that would agree to pay for my college education mm -hmm. at night on the weekends and that was an insurance company called occidental life of california mm -hmm. and i took that role and you'll read about it in the propaganda i sent you but not to bore your audience I stayed with that company for two years. And then I decided to go into the Peace Corps because I didn't like work very much and I didn't have a lot of skills, but they needed people in a place called Cameroon in Northwestern Africa yeah. to work 
in the agricultural fields there. So I quit my job to join the Peace Corps, but there was a war going on next door in what was then called Biafra. And my training kept getting postponed and I was taking part-time jobs. And after eight months, I realized they were never going to send me or take me to the training. And I went out and found my next job and it was with the household finance company, which was doing consumer lending, 600 hour loans, 300 hour loans, mm -hmm. as much as 1500 hour loans, all small loans to individuals. And I spent the next year in consumer credit, but they were paying for my coursework at LaSalle College and my major was marketing. It, I started as accounting, I hated accounting, and I changed to marketing because I could graduate with four less accounting courses. And I stayed in that field for about a year, and then I moved to commercial credit for a, a, a cigar manufacturer company mm -hmm. who did the same thing. I was an assistant credit manager. We uh, managed house accounts. Our, we managed our customers, and they gave me the responsibility to manage invoicing. So I was still in my early 20s, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. But as I matriculated, as I approached 30, people started to say, you're good at this, John. And I realized that if you're good at it, it might be something that would be a good career for you. I don't know about everyone else, but I assume we're all similar that unless you know what you want to be, uh, we find our way. And then you find your, you find your mission when you find that you're good at something and people compliment you for it and they reward you for being good at it and you decide this is what you're going to do. And I will stop so that you can speak, but I found that I really enjoyed the relationship between customers and salespeople and administration people and the problem solving that credit offered. And I didn't have to be particularly skilled at anything except communications and staying calm and just following the process and spending the time necessary to resolve the misunderstandings that associate itself with customers and collections. But I enjoyed that work tremendously because people patted me on the back continually because I was patient and I worked endlessly because it was the way I was raised to be. So you found what you were genetically create. I mean, quoting I Jim Collins, you finally found what you was what you were genetically created to do. I think so. Because I, uh, no, I, I remember I remember he said he, he was writing like, you know, uh, I think it was he, he said that about Matt. He said I was taken seriously I was very serious about math about you know I was learning I was working on it then I've seen what people who genetically created to that what they do I cannot even stand that next to that but that that's uh, that, that's interesting because uh, I got quite similar feeling to that because I started my career again I was collecting <coughs> being part of uh, bank security service and I was you know, the idea of protecting you know doing that that's kind of romantic it was kind of romantic for me <coughs> sorry and uh, finally I get my first job as a credit controller and started to do it and it was like wow I'm finally doing, you know, what I think. And again, people who were saying, look, look at what you do. You are exactly at the right place. And this is the thing. So, And your success, 
coming back to my question so your success factor was just enjoying what you do being in love with what you do and uh, and actually helping people yes and and i think my parents had something to do with my preparation in in this way uh, whatever i had any success at my father applauded me he was my, <coughs> he was my rooting section whatever i did and it was good he thought it was better than good. Mm -hmm. And my mother always said, you could do better. I, I remember I, I went on my first interviews at 18 years old. I went on 11 interviews and I got 10 job offers. And my father was thrilled. And my mother said, you shot too low, that's why. You're interviewing for too less of a position. She was always my critic but she loved me, but she always criticized me. Yeah. So yeah. there was a balance there, and, and, and that inspired me to try to do more. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. but, but you, had, you had extremely nice combination, so you had an inspire who was admiring you, and you was like voice of wisdom who was saying, uh, not, it's not yet the end, as, as it is said in, yes. in, in, in Ichin, the Chin, in Chinese book, it's, this is not the end, so there is still something you can do. Yes, that's, that's amazing. Um, I was planning this question. No, I will, I will, ask, I will ask it when, 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 when it was planned. So, may I ask, I mean, 60 years in credit i spent now now i understand how young i am in terms of credit career with my 20 something but uh staying that long in one profession means you are in love with it and uh, obviously we don't choose our passion we don't choose our love but uh there is always kind of beauties we find in our favorite job, in, 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 the, in, in, our, in, in the business we do, in the job we do, in love, in terms of relationship. But what beauties, maybe other beauties than you already explained of credit management uh, you found over your career, which may be you know fall you down in love with that profession or help you to stay in love with this profession for that long time so and and maybe this will be a bit of a contradiction as mm -hmm. much as i i love the work that i did in credit mm -hmm. i would i would change jobs with some frequency and the most time I ever in one job was 12 years but mm -hmm. it started as a US credit manager and it became an America's credit manager and then it became a global credit manager so I didn't change the job the job changed me because they kept giving me more responsibility but I was sitting in the same seat in Palo Alto California or mm -hmm. Cupertino California my roles and responsibilities changed and I, and I can remember the treasurer at Hewlett Packard when I was the credit manager after 11 and a half years, mm -hmm. we had literally 50 divisions, five zero, 50 divisions. Yes. And we were in nine different businesses and I had a team, they all didn't report to me, but they reported to me functionally, a team of literally 500 people in credit and collections around the world of which I managed maybe a hundred of them directly uh -huh. and 400 of them I had a dotted line responsibility for the way they performed the function of credit or collections but they reported to a local controllership or operations management yep. person and the and the treasurer said John we've moved you out of the field operation 
you're now a corporate employee. My job never changed. I always had a dotted line to the treasurer, but now mm -hmm. I had a solid line and I had an office in Palo Alto. It was a desk, but they called it an office. And I would go there once a week and four days a week, I would go where my credit team was in Santa Clara County, about 20 miles away. And he said, I'm really happy to tell you, you're now a corporate employee because we're gonna to start to break up the Hewlett Packard company and we didn't want to have to sell a division and you got sold with the division. You're going to be here. You're 48 years old. You've been doing this job for 12 years. You can do it for another 12 years and retire at 60 because senior managers at Hewlett Packard, when I was 48 years old, they had to retire at 60 years old because Bill Hewlett and David Packard said that was the time to turn over responsibility to the next generation. And if you've targeted 60, you were out of there by 62 or 63. And as one of my managers told me when I was 27 years old at Hewlett Packard, if you stay at Hewlett Packard 20 years and you're not a millionaire, you're stupid. That's, that's now, and when I was there 20 years, I wasn't a millionaire. So you're talking to a stupid man today, but I just want to let you know that. I didn't become mil a millionaire in corporate career as well, so don't worry. <laughs> la, so, la, la, la. <laughs> but it, after, at that point, I said to the treasurer, Larry Tomlinson, a wonderful gentleman, in fact, he's a, a board member with a company called uh, Salesforce.com today. He's a mm -hmm. bit older than me, but he's still active and skis 50 days a year. Mm -hmm. And I said, Larry, I'm leaving. <laughs> he said, no, we just got you here. Where are you going? I said, I'm going back into sales. And it was because I had two small children and I was always on the road somewhere. And I, my children were seven years apart in age. And the older one was now 12 years old and I never saw him. And the little one was five and I wanted to see him more. And I said, I'm taking a job in Phoenix, Arizona with Hewlett Packard to run a sales operation for a distributor that we do business with there. And he was befuddled. He, he just said, you know, that, that was, I worked so hard to get you here and now you're leaving. But it, intellectually, after 12 years, I couldn't make any more of a contribution to the role of credit in Hewlett Packard. Any gift that I could give to the organization, any leadership that I had to demonstrate mm -hmm. was all demonstrated. It was time to turn it over to the next team of people, some of which I had prepared. Because early in my 24 years with Hewlett Packard, it was always embedded into me that if you want to be promoted, you prepare people to replace you in your existing responsibility. And then if you're in the right place at the right time, you may get a promotional opportunity because we have someone who can step into your shoes yes. and allow you to move on without disrupting the organization you're managing today. But if you don't prepare your successor, you probably won't have a successor. You'll probably just be there for a very long time. That, and that's the way I was trained earlier in my career at HP. It isn't a question of right or wrong. That was just the thinking that was implored upon me. Yeah, it's that security for the company, since as we protect, we need to prepare a replacement. It might be risky in terms of career, I can tell you, but that's that that's already a different story. It's not yes. we we know that it it, it 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 might be risky personally, but taking seriously your responsibility about company's portfolio, you, we must have successors. We must have somebody who will replace because we. We should we should prevent any any sort of business disruption, and this is again, uh, you know, speaking with you, I understand that was the right, the right 
principle I defined so far. It's just uh, we choose. We choose. I mean, company should choose a credit manager first of all by by attitude, and the attitude has only one word. The explanation of attitude has only one word of explanation. Just just care. One who cares should be a credit manager. While why one who does not should never step into the office. Well, thank you very much for the beauties. It was quite interesting and uh, about failures what was your biggest or oh, you 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 can pick only one you can pick. Well, I gave you a list you know it's I, an I, I, I know the list but audience do, we, we won't see it I keep it for myself so far we will publish it later but if you just if you just share one failure it's not an HR question it's just uh, like I don't think it should be the biggest the correct question would be not your biggest failure like in the biggest bad dad or biggest something uh, what I'm trying to say what was your what was the failure which gave you the biggest learning in your professional life it was, it was early in my Hewlett Packard career. Mm -hmm. um, I joined Hewlett Packard as a credit specialist in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, outside mm -hmm. of Philadelphia in 1974. And I was only in credit about 15 months and I was re promoted to a role of repair order processing manager. And there was a gentleman who was responsible for sales. His name was Alan Shallop. I'm still in touch with him today. He's in his mid 80s, living not too far from me here in Scottsdale, Arizona. And we were young men in 1975, 76. And we were in a meeting. And uh, as a credit manager in the UK once said to me, John, you and I are a lot alike. The only difference is I only speak when I have something to say. He was uh, Scottish and he wanted me to know that I spoke all the time and I didn't necessarily have something to say when I spoke. And that was at that conference in 1989 that I told you about earlier mm -hmm. in the Alps in France. In any event, I misspoke in a meeting and I offended this man. And he took me aside the next day and he said, I want you to know how offended I was when you misspoke. But he said, I'm also telling you in my disappointment how I'm forgiving you for disappointing me because everyone deserves a second chance. That was one of two situations where a sales manager took me aside as a young 25 or 26 year old who yeah. had misspoke. And I had offended him in my speaking. And that was my greatest failure. And, and later when I was promoted to become a regional equipment leasing and contracts sales manager, to mm -hmm. Rockville, Maryland in the late 70s for Hewlett Packard. The sales manager for the region, not for the office, but for the Northeastern United States, uh, he took me aside and he said, you know, John, I've noticed about you. When you're in a meeting, if someone attacks your position, you kill them. You just destroy that person. And now I'm about 28 or 29 years old. And he said, I'm going to tell you two things. You don't have to change. But you will pay a price for it down the road. Because if, if, if you take people's criticism or their point of view that's different than yours, if you take it personally, if you're offended by it and you turn around and offend them, 
in a sincere way and cut them off because you have a higher leadership position than they do, you're going to succeed that day. But down the road, your growth will be curtailed. You will not continue to succeed. And this man was a friend of mine, but he was being very direct to me. And he was also a dotted line manager of mine. Mm -hmm. And those two gentlemen, Al Shallop in Pennsylvania and John Sundry in Rockville, Maryland, they were my two greatest failures. And I learned in incredible lesson from both of those men and both of those mistakes that helped guide me to be a kinder and a better person or strive to be a kinder and a better person going forward. And they now, were my greatest failures. And now we can see you really succeeded in that. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, that, that that's really sensitive and you know we, we all know that you know in corporate world we have not it, that that corporate corporate road is not rosy and we also got you know difficult and everything but we all are learning and we're go, going through and uh, your career shown, uh, ladies and gentlemen, again, I invite you to see John's profile on LinkedIn because it shows perfectly that you got like stripes, you got black, white, you got corporate career, then you got consulting, then you got corporate career as well. And uh, Mike, so you know, you knew quite early the both sides of of that specialist approach on corporate side and on the consultant side. So you learn quite early that there is credit after credit after the corporate. There is a job. There is life after the corporate job. And what beauties of credit management? What are the sides of credit management? you found outside the corporate credit manager's role? So I was a consultant out of uh, necessity, I suppose, because uh, when I was 50 years old, I was working for a Japanese bank. In, I had just moved back from here where I am in Scottsdale, Arizona today, from right here in this home back to the Philadelphia area to work for Tokai Bank of Nagano, Japan. Mm -hmm. They had a financial services subsidiary doing business throughout the United States, but headquartered in a town called Berwyn, uh, a, a Welsh name, I believe, uh, or Scottish name, in Berwyn, Pennsylvania, outside of Philadelphia. And they provided financing solutions for all Japanese manufacturers doing business in the United States. And I was recruited there to take a, a position as the vice president of customer care. And the intention was they wanted to take the company public in 12 months and their investment bankers had told them that their credit operations and their back offices were clumsy and they needed to change those back office performance metrics in order to have a successful public offer. And in that year, the public offering turned out to be a sale of the company. Mm -hmm. And so it was only a 12 month role that I was there for. But I, I retired out of that position because I had an employment contract that said if they sold more than 50% of the company in the first 12 months, they would pay me for five years and I could leave. And that's what I did. Mm -hmm. But I came back and it was 1999 and I was here in Scottsdale and I was attending baseball games with my sons because I was unemployed. And I got a call from the assistant treasurer of a local company here who knew me from mm -hmm. my role in credit. 
and he said, you're too young to retire. Come to this meeting that was sponsored by Dun & Bradstreet. And this company was called Allied Signal, and they were merging in the next year with a company called Honeywell. And he said, I want to hire you to help us efficientize our treasury operations. So I didn't plan to be a consultant, but this bluebird showed up. His name was Alan Silberman. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's better to know who you know rather than to be smart enough to attain something on your own. Yeah. All my luck came from building relationships. But yes. Alan said, we're merging 32 treasury operations globally between Allied Signal and Honeywell. And I want you to help me and one other consultant. I want you, the two of you to help me figure out which ones do we keep and which ones do we purge and why? And our goal is to save $10 million in operating expense after a 24 month transition period. They achieved that goal. They did most of the work themselves, but I had a lot of quality training because of my 24 years at Hewlett Packard, because in those days you were constantly going to school. They, yes. Hewlett Packard would send you to graduate programs for two or three weeks or a month, or they would, I mean, it was, it was a wonderful time to be in corporate America. It's not that way today. And, and they would have continual learning. You were required to participate, but it, it was a gift. And, and out of that experience with Allied Signal and Honeywell, other, op, other people started to call me. So I became a consultant. And I must have sent out 1,500 resumes over a 10-year period. I was in my 50s. Who wanted to hire a guy who was in his 50s? Yes. You know how hard that is. If you don't have a job, it's hard to get a job. But I was bumping along as a consultant, and you spend more than half of your time finding work, and then you spend less than half of your time delivering that work. Yeah. Some of it was very rewarding, but most of it was very humbling. <laughs> yeah. So. so that's how I became a consultant. But I but when I would look would look back, I would say, you had such a great role, but you gave it up. But I also felt, you know, at the end of life, if you only do what you're good at, your life can't be always that interesting. I felt I would be wasting my time if I did the same thing for 24 years and then retired. So there were some periods when I, you know, the yanks that's inside you, that you make a decision and sometimes you wish you had the responsibility you gave up. Those moments exist. Yes. But it, it turned out because of being a consultant and because I was always working, even though I wasn't always getting paid, but I was always working. I was either giving my time or prospecting or working a consulting engagement. Yeah. Hitachi called me when I was 60 years old. They didn't ask me how old I was. They just said, we want to create a global credit operation and we want you to do it for us. Okay. And it was, uh, which year that was? That was uh, something like 13 years ago. It was, it was, they called me in October of 1999. Okay. And I, and I was in a, a startup at the time. Yeah. Uh, and it was a credit startup where we created credit software mm -hmm. to analyze financial statements of public and private companies in any country, in any language, in any gap. And we converted it all if it was a US customer. Our first customer was Disney. Mm -hmm. so we converted it all to US dollars and US gap. And we, any customer they asked anywhere around the world, we could show them a comparative analysis of risk factors mm -hmm. and strengths and weaknesses. And they really liked that. 
John. I was the ninth of nine, trust me. There mm -hmm. was the, the one of nine was really the brains behind it. Mm -hmm. Then there were the seven of nine that were all key. And then I was the ninth of nine because I was the face of credit and they needed a face for credit. And we came, we started the company without too much capital. We started it with borrowed funds from friends and family for $300,000. Oh. And we couldn't pay too many people too much money. So we said, here's your target salary and you're all gonna start at 50% of your target salary. And we'll pay you back when we're successful, but it will accrue for you. So maybe someday you'll get it back. And then after a year, they said, that 50% salary, we're gonna make that to a 25% salary because we haven't been remarkably successful at all. Yeah. So I went to 25%, but I still had two sons to put through college and I was making 25% of my targeted income. And Itachi comes along and offers me a job that will allow me to send my kids to college. And I took it and I left that startup and I sold my founding shares back to the company for the $200 I paid for it. And they gave me my $200. And I, for, I didn't forget about it. I kept following them. Mm -hmm. And I joined Atachi and had a wonderful experience at Atachi. And then in 2015, the CFO called me and she said, John, our company, this is that little startup that wasn't worth anything. She said, we've just been valued at $50 million. And the nine founders are going to be allowed to sell 11% of their shares when we borrow, we're taking a $10 million investment from this investment bank in October of that year. And I said, why are you calling me? I sold my shares back. And she said, have you talked to Venkat? And Venkat was Dr. Venkat Srinivasan. I said, no, I haven't talked to him in a couple of years. She said, you should call him. So I called him and he said, well, you know, John, I know I gave you your money back, but you worked so hard. I never took the stock out of your name. So I still owned a percentage of this little startup. And as we're progressing through my years at Itachi, I'm not paying any attention to it. It turns out that IBM and another company are competing to buy this company two years later. Mm -hmm. And on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th of 2017, a company called GenPack bought Rage Frameworks for their artificial intelligence mm -hmm. software for a low to mid nine figure number. And the only problem that that created was an incredible tax problem because I was living in California and, and they have like a 10% income tax for residents of California. And I said to Atachi, would you move me back to Scottsdale, Arizona, where I always had a home here, but I only visited it once in a while. And they said, no, I don't know if we'll do that. And I said, well, I'm moving back by, the, by November because I don't want to pay the tax. So they agreed to do that. And for the last years of my employment, I was living here and this is my office. I'm sitting in my office in my home in Scottsdale. And I ran the credit operation for Hitachi for the last uh, four years of my 12 years with Hitachi from here in Scottsdale because I was always on an airplane to somewhere else yeah. in the world. That's the job of global credit manager. Yes. You know. Well, uh, I remember my couple of interviews and for, for, the, for the roles, even for regional credit manager and they say, but you know, the job is located there. You no, know, I, I know, you know, out of my 20 years of career that the job of global credit manager is located in a plane. This is it, you know, it's, uh, and I don't say there is something wrong, right or wrong with that because I believe you agree that uh, the right place for credit manager is in the office of a customer. <laughs> yes, it, it, it's, it's, it's managing the relationship that enables orders to be booked 
and payments to be made. Yeah. You're, we are in sales and we are in collections. There are two roles. We are, n nothing happens until someone sells something. And we have to ensure that we're not an impediment to the selling process, but we cannot lose money supporting sales. We have to be smart about it. Absolutely. I, you know, when, uh, when people ask me uh, to explain, you know, credit manager, credit management, you know, in the less possible number of words, I always recall a great phrase by Abe Sanchez. You remember Walking Bear? Walking Bear. You say, keep them buying and keep them paying. This is it. <laughs> That's quite nice in American way. Yeah. Uh, John, one, as I promised, that there is there are two tricky questions. First one is uh, I throughout my career, it's quite kind of personal question throughout my career, I found that becoming a credit manager, even credit director is mainly matter of being professional. Again, this, this presumes relationship management with everybody, but you need to be helpful. You need to know many different things, so on and so forth. But getting what I found is that moving from even credit director's role to head of credit could be a tricky move. How did you find it and what what is you know, what is the difference and what is the secret of getting from one of that last or let's say last uh, last grade in credit management career? So I have two answers. The first one's easy. I don't know. But now I'm going to tell you the hard, the, easy, the, the less than easy one is, this is what I think it is, but I honestly don't know. Yeah. It's a maturing that takes place where you're observed to be able to be fluid and comfortable in your own skin working with the CFO's office and with the sales office and the customer and the inner workings of all the operational operation components of your company mm -hmm. in a manner that is unwavering and unruffling where you don't make waves you just fit seamlessly in the business process and you affect change when i the first interview i had at atachi in november of 2000 of 1999 uh, excuse me, 2009, pardon me. I asked the VP responsible for operations. I said, if I'm offered this job and I accept it, and we're speaking in 12 or 18 months, what will have happened in that period of time if I'm remarkably successful? And if that's difficult to answer, what will not have happened if I'm remarkably unsuccessful? Tell me now what I should achieve in the first 12 to 18 months in your eyes as the VP of operations where credit was part of their responsibility. And he said, John, that's easy for me to answer. If you are remarkably successful in 12 to 18 months, you will have positively affected the performance of organizations that do not report to you. And if you're unsuccessful, you will have had no positive impact on the organizations that you're not responsible for. Because credit and collections touches everything. And sure. you're going to find where the inefficiencies in Atachi data systems are. Yes. And you're going to have to seamlessly identify them in a non-threatening way and help those leaders recognize their deficiencies, 
and move to improving their processes that allows the order to cash process to improve because you can't fix it within credit and collections. You're just an auditor. You identify the problem, but you can't solve the problem. Yes. So again, master of arrows in organization chat, you are connecting, connecting, connecting. It's a relationship. Uh, there was a lady who worked with me uh, named Andrea Dunn in the, in, we called it the Project 90s. In 1989, we were moving credit in the United States from Hewlett Packard from 55 offices to one in Atlanta and, and a backup office in Santa Clara. And we had, and 55 offices had probably 41 different processes between mm -hmm. the 55 offices. So we had to standardize the process and move it to a central operation with new people. And, and we did some of it very clumsily because we tried to change the process on the way to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And then we realized that we either take the old process in and manage many of those 41 processes the same way until they get to Atlanta and then create a better process once it's there. But you can't change process as you're transferring responsibilities. You only can do one or the other, but you don't know that without experience to know that you sure. failed. This was another one of my failures, I forgot. But, you know, we tried the, to move a pro change a process and move it simultaneously. Yeah. We didn't see that. When we, then we decided, we're just going to take your process and replicate it in Atlanta. And then once it gets here, we're going to stabilize it. And then we're going to transition it to a common new process that everyone in the order to cash group would agree on. She developed a relationship map that had credit and collections in the center and arrows going in 30 ways. If I find it in my archives, I'll send it to you. It's the best picture of order to cash that I've ever seen. And Andrea created it because there are so many touch points. We touch everything. Yes. We ask customers to do everything. And then before they pay, they tell us why they're not going to pay us. Or they tell us why they're unhappy with the Hewlett Packard company or the Itachi company. And then they pay us when we solve those problems. Absolutely. And the last, I mean, you already explained everything, but I will still ask because we will discuss that when we were preparing our today's event. Uh, I know many people and I am recently turned half half a century this year. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you. I still feel young, but... Uh, you are still young. Yeah, thank you. Uh, what I, what I try to say, we say that ageism is not, a, is not like an uncommon problem. We know it, it, it happens and we know that lots of people got an issue, got issues with finding a job even after 40, not even 50. And you managed to get a job being 60 and based on what I've heard from you today have been inspiring. Yeah, there are two keys to that. Uh, like you need to be, you need to be interested about profession, continue to be interested about profession because you, you are doing many things and uh, you, you should not lose courage at any cost. Any, any, a, anything you would add to that? So, I mean, what I'm trying to say, good things could happen. You need to believe in it. Therefore, don't lose courage. But maybe there is another secret to that. So I, I'm going to go back to when I was five years old. Okay. 1954. So you do the math. And I'm walking. I think I'm in a, in a wagon and my sister and my mother are pulling me up the street and I'm five years old. I could have walked, but 
I was in the wagon. And we come to a lemonade stand, and there's a 12-year-old boy named David Landau who was a neighbor, and he's selling lemonade. And my mother stops, and for a penny, she buys me, and for another penny, she buys my sister a glass of lemonade. Mm -hmm. And David Landau looks at my mother and says, I'll never forget this, Mrs. LaRocca, you think your children are better than anybody else's children. <laughs> And I don't know why he said it specifically, but I know my mother was very proud of her children and she was a very self-confident person. And she said, David, that's not true. My children aren't better than anyone else, but mm -hmm. no one is better than my children. And that was the beginning of the development of my own self-esteem. And I believe if the, if you have a healthy self-esteem, you can do anything. And you, it doesn't make you fearless. No one likes rejection. It's painful. Yes. But you have to put rejection aside and keep applying yourself. In those 10 years that I was a consultant, before Hitachi called me, I sent out 1,500 resumes. I may have gone on two or three interviews they were shitty resumes, obviously, by the fact that I sent so many out over a nine and a half year period. But I kept working as a consultant. And regardless if I was being paid, I was developing skills and I was out in the marketplace. And as one of the executives I worked for at uh, Tokai Bank's subsidiary in Pennsylvania, he called it standing under the rim in basketball terminology. If you stand under the rim, the ball will come to you sometimes. Yeah. But if you're not under the rim, the ball's never going to come to you. So yeah. you have to be engaged. You can't be sitting back doing nothing. Volunteer, work for a community association, work for a charitable organization. Be engaged working with people as you're striving to find the next opportunity. But building and maintaining your personal self-esteem is essential to finding any opportunity, I think. John, I do thank you very much for today's session. That That's really amazing to speak with you and get your advices ladies and <laughs> ladies and gents we still got a bit of time uh where when you can ask a question or two to john and uh i mean we still got kind of 10 to 15 minutes and with i think we got i mean le le let me read some comments uh, I remember HFC, that must be a tough job, yeah. <laughs> Sir, how was to create a global organization from the scratch? Uh, well, it's question from Rodrigo. Uh, I don't believe it is possible to explain. With my knowledge, I don't believe it is possible to explain in even, even in 15 hours how to build global credit operation, but what uh what could you say about this so rodrigo thank you for the question and it's it's easier than it sounds our responsibility as leaders is first to develop the people that you are responsible for people sometimes make the mistake of saying i'm taking on a new responsibility and I'm going to bring this person in from my past experience and that person in from my past experience. And they're going to help me build the team that uh, I need to develop here. And what I did when I arrived at Itachi is I looked at the existing team and I met with them regularly. Mm -hmm. My goal within the first 90 days was, was to fully understand the role of each of the 12 or 13 people in Santa Clara operation and credit 
collections and cash application, understand their history, develop knowledge of their wisdom from all their experience at Itachi, and then share with them my vision of the responsibilities, the mission of credit. The mission of credit is to grow revenue and do so without losing too much money. And I can remember the person who I developed to replace me as the director of credit was a credit analyst when I joined in 2010. And she was promoted in 2021 to become the global director of credit. That's one of my greatest successes in my career. I would say it's the most important contribution that I've made to a company was developing a successful, not replacement for me, she's better than me. She's a CPA, she has better credit skills, but I brought out and I was able to share with her my experience as a relationship manager and I was able to empower her and to give some of my responsibility to my team members to help them grow and develop other managers. Robert Pock in Krakow, Mahesh Sabarjian in Kuala Lumpur, these are th and, and Milo Ramos in Santa Clara, who's the director of global credit. These three people were the nucleus of the global credit team that I left when I decided to leave Hitachi, but nothing changed. The performance didn't change because I left. I made yes. myself dispensable because I gave them responsibility. And I replicated what we did in Santa Clara, first in Krakow and then in Kuala Lumpur. You know, I'm awful at language. I studied Spanish. I was awful at it. But, you know, I would go to Mexico City when I was responsible for the Americas and they said, Senior La Roca, they, I had a beard then and they used to call me Senior Kenny Rogers. And they would say, you need to make your presentations in Spanish. So I had a friend who would write my, present, my English presentations in Spanish and then in my broken English, I delivered my presentation in Spanish. I became real and I accepted my inefficiencies and people embraced you for being real. Yeah. And, and, and Rodrigo, I asked people to do something that they may not always do. And that is always stay calm. The role of a credit person is to keep harmony. It's, it's not to be yelling and screaming. And apparently before I arrived at Itachi, there was a lot of yelling and screaming that took place in the credit and sales relationship. And it was just to approach things calmly and do the things you do locally. You go to the next place. The only thing is different is the language. But today, everybody speaks either Spanish or English. And well, they put up with us who speak English. They, uh, they, they welcome us into their offices, maybe because they have to, but they do it. And we, we just treat each other with dignity and respect. And, and, and we give some of our responsibility. We delegate it. We come a little bit lazy because that will develop those people. And when then they have problems, you teach them to come to you before the problem is unsurmountable, that you can't, you know, always create the trust in your staff. Tell them that it's okay to fail. It's okay to make a mistake. It's okay to make the wrong decision, but you need to have your justification for the error you made. If you don't have a good reason for making an error, that's unacceptable. But making an error is okay. Everybody can be wrong. Just have a good basic process and the willingness to communicate. And it's true everywhere. And the, the globe is not such a big place. You know, when you look at the pictures from the telescopes, apparently our globe is pretty small compared to the, 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 the rest of the uh, universe. So 
Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you for your, for the opportunity. Thank you for your time, though. It means a lot. It, we just well, learned a lot with you uh, from you. It's I could spend like hours and hours here uh, listening to your sharing your experience with us. Well, just reach out to me anytime. Mm, I'm, yes, I'm happy to communicate with anyone. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. You're Sorry, welcome. Andrew, to interrupt you. No worries. Yeah. No worries. There. That, that's the event is for you. So uh john just to finish with that so mainly what i hear from your words it's a couple of ideas i had like in terms of definition is that main thing is not really creating a function is not really creating processes or something but main thing is a creation of culture internal culture internal credit culture if you wish is that something like this no, I, I think that's well, it's, it's well stated. Thank you. Um, any You're other very questions? Welcome. Any, any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? I know that asking such a nice person uh, like John need, needs a preparation because I was preparing myself well in advance. But if you, if you are if you if, if one and really necessary thing to learn from john is how to be humble and you've learned that over the last hour and now you are as humble so you are unable to ask questions please john is the one of the nicest person i know in my life so please don't hesitate to reach him and ask questions uh find him via linkedin connect with him and uh, again ask him for advice he's very help he's very very helpful and he was very helpful to me so if you were again too humble to ask questions uh, today please don't hesitate to ask them publicly or send your questions to me and i will transfer your question or questions or requests for well, we'll trust them to John myself. Yes, Bella, please switch on your video and phone and ask question. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, Hello, we do Bella. hear you. Yeah, we do hear you. You are with us. Good evening, sir. How are you? Good evening. Good. And how are For you? some reason, I cannot put on my, my video. It's okay. I think the host stopped me. Yes, Nana Kohevenaki. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, could be. Now, try, try now. Okay, let me try. Better? Oh, yeah. There you are. Such a lovely face. I'm glad we get to see you. How are you? I'm very good. How are you How doing? Are you? Good. I'm okay. Yeah. Like I, I, I'm so happy that I got the time to attend the session. And I've always, I've always been um, humble myself, and I've been told that building relationships, it's of much of importance in the credit and collection. And I can tell you now, it's helping me a lot. I'm sorry, my daughter's here. Uh, <laughs> sorry, go ask your brother now. Oh, that's okay. That's why we do what we do. Yes, yes. So so also I'm I'm really I'm 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 really grateful for the for the lessons that, that you shared with us. And we're gonna connect via LinkedIn and I hope god keeps you for us so that going forward we can learn from you even more interact with you daily in our daily functions we can be able to you are such an amazing professional you, I, I i welcome any question at any time and i'd be happy to, to communicate with you and speak thank you so much it's me my pleasure thank you and it's nice to meet you thank nice you nice to meet you uh well as we have no further questions please stay with us 
please don't hesitate to contact John. John, my list of things could last another hour and a half, I believe. <laughs> But I don't think audience will, will, will won't. I'm, I'm not sure this this won't annoy the audience as much as it is as I used to do because I always speak too much. But I will learn to stay calm and to stay silent myself as well because I developed that skill as well. Uh, John will be with us, and I, I believe this this is not the last time we have. John in our in our in our issues John I will I will be giving you calls from time to time unless you want because and, and I will abuse our relations thank you very 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 much for coming and for sharing with us your experience and helping us to develop the bridge between the generations uh, I wish you make me feel so old. <laughs> please, please. I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. Please, you just told me that I am young. So if I am young, <laughs> you are not too old at all. So, so I, I will tell you what to be prepared for in 23 years. Yeah. When you are 73, you will feel like you do at 50. Mm -hmm. And you will feel like you do at 18 because at 50, mm -hmm. you feel like you did when you were 18. Yes. <laughs> we don't change the the wrapper changes, but the yeah. person doesn't change. The person just becomes more experienced and hopefully we all become better people if we get to live a long life, because what other goal should there be? Exactly. And I'm happy well, to participate with you whenever you ask me to. It's, it's been will, my pleasure. I will send you sooner, quite soon, trust me, I will send you an invitation for another interesting discussion on LinkedIn. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for finding time for, for our today's event. And uh, I hope to see you on our coming events next one will will be in august i don't know what it will be but it will be for sure and in the meantime i wish all of you to have high sales low losses or as people in here in, in geneva might say in french bon credit have a nice whatever time you have and uh, speak very soon on our next event Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And thank you, Andre. Thank, thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you so Bye. much.